Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back to our weekly webinar series. Apologies for the slight delay because of a technical issue today. And uh, today we have a very important topic um, dwelling into the nuances of uh, nuances of uh, section forty three. And uh, I think this is a very very important part because uh, the whole avoidance transaction part has been dwelled upon, discussed many times in the past. Uh, uh, on this platform as well as others but uh, we can have a look at what has happened recently in that space and uh, you know have a recap of what we can do with respect to that part of the IBC. over to anil sir thank you very much ankit thanks a lot uh, so you see section 43 which is preferential transactions there are many issues in fact which uh, has actually slightly been clarified in this uh, NCLAT case, Dina Rasayan Udyog Private Limited versus Ms. Pooja Bari. This judgment was on 24th of April 2023 by NCLAT. And this particular judgment used the judgment of Anuj Jain, uh, that was a Supreme Court judgment in the case of uh, uh, the uh, JP Infratech Limited. And by using this particular judgment, the NCLAT also reiterated the various other issues. Some of the issues which has actually now has been surfaced on the section 43 preferential transactions regarding the, the what is the ordinary course of business? Because see the transactions in ordinary course of business are exempt from being considered as preferential transaction. Also, or the transactions of uh, under the financial affairs of the corporate debtor or the transferee. So before I share my PPT with you, I actually would like to share the, the kind of uh, the construction of this section 43. So if I say construction means I am just sharing my Screen. So I will take you to the code. Now the code says, as far as the section 43 is concerned, so there are two things which are very, very important in the code. One, it says that the, where the liquidator or the resolution professionals, that means this application can be filed by liquidator or a resolution professional, as the case may be, is of the opinion. So the first thing is that the opinion has to be there. So here I would like to say that now <clears throat> the clarity is that the first important part is that the resolution professional or the liquidator should form an opinion. And once he forms an opinion, there are two options. One, that he can analyze the transactions himself or he can appoint a transactional auditor also. In the entire code, Nowhere it has been mentioned that the transactional appointment of a transactional auditor or forensic auditor, whatever you may call, is mandatory or is provided in the law. So what is provided in the law is that the opinion is of the opinion. The liquidator or the RP is of the opinion that the corporate debtor has at a relevant time. So the second important part is relevant time. Now the relevant time is provided in the look back period, which is one year for the unrelated parties and two years for the related parties. So this two things, like first of all, forming an opinion. And secondly, the transactions must have taken place in the relevant time. These are the two primary conditions of invocation of section 43. So this has been clarified in uh, the judgment of Anuj Jain uh, in the where the corporate debtor was JP Infratech. And also in the case of uh, uh, the recent NCLAT judgment dated 24th of April 2023. So these two things are very, very important, uh, opinion and the relevant dates, relevant time. Then comes in the transaction in such manner as laid down in section 2 and also in section 4. So in case you see, there are two positive sections, subsection 2, and subsection four. And then there is a negative section, section three. 
तो फर्स्ट टेस्ट इज दैट इट शुड बी फॉर्मिंग एन ओपिनियन सेकेंड इज दैट इट द्रांजेक्शन शुड बी इन रेलिवेंट टाइम एंड द फर्स्ट टेस्ट इज सबसेक्शन टू सबसेक्शन टू से इज नाउ सबसेक्शन टू से इज वेरी क्लियरली देर इज ए ट्रांसफर ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी और एन इंटरेस्ट देर ऑफ ऑफ द कॉर्पोरेट डेटर transfer of property the property has been defined under the law under the ibc also so i don't need to discuss on the property because the property includes everything including money everything whatever is having any value is a property or an interest thereof at the interest thereof is also something which is akin to a property like you you have a interest thereon which is not fully crystallized but it may crystallize some kind of contingency is still existing but yes there is an interest in that particular property and then for the is transferred transferred for the benefit of a creditor or a surety or a grantor or on account of an incident financial or operational debt or other liabilities owned by the corporate debtor first there should be a transfer of property or an interest thereon secondly it should be for the benefit of a creditor or a surety or a grantor so three things creditor surety or a grantor it should be for the benefit of a creditor surety or a grantor or on account of an antecedent financial debt or operational debt antecedent financial debt or operational debt or any other liability means any existing debt any existing operational debt any existing financial debt or any existing other liabilities of the corporate debtor condition number 1 again opinion second relevant time third transfer of property or interest thereon fourth it should be transferred to for the benefit of a creditor or a surety or a grantor the creditor surety or a grantor must have an antecedent financial debt antecedent matlab an existing debt so like there are although it's a positive section 1 it we are only at positive section 1 so presently we have now five things to reckon that is the test number 1 opinion relevant time transfer of property benefit of the creditor surety or grantor and an existing debt existing debt so these are the positive things that we must have tick 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 in case we have all the ticks then we go further then we go further by just doing this transfer of property or interest thereon under the clause sub clause a of sub section 2 the effect of putting such creditor or surety or a grantor in a beneficial position <clears throat> in a beneficial position then it would have been in the event of a distribution of assets being made in accordance with section 53 now in section 53 in case we do something that we pay to an operational creditor whereas the operational creditor entitlement is much lower in section 53 so we we are paying him as per the opinion as per the in, within the relevant time we are transferring a property we are transferring money we are transferring funds so this is a positive section this is a positive section now the second second positive section is which is subsection 4 now sub section subsection 4 says the preference shall be deemed to be given at a relevant time relevant time is if it is given to a related party other than by reasons only of being an employee so employees are not covered uh, employees are not related party during the period of 2 years preceding the insolvency commencement date second a preference is given to a person other than related party during the period of 1 year preceding the insolvency commencement date so now the two positive sections and there are in fact seven tick items one opinion has been formed two it falls into the relevant time of two years and one year three the it has there is a transfer of property or or, or interest thereon three four it is transferred for the benefit of a creditor surety or a grantor then it is transferred against an existing debt it may be financial debt operational debt or other liabilities and then finally by just doing this by just doing this that person has actually gained a little uh, benefit under section 53 if i am paying to a secured creditor 
that is not a preferential transaction. I'm paying to a secured financial creditor, but then the other, other person, like the other financial creditors can say that it is being paid to one secured creditor, but not to the all. So that again is a preferential transaction where it has to be given to uh, all secured financial creditors, pari pasu, based on their value of security interest. Um, that issue is still pending, but yes. But in case the corporate debtor is making a repayment to only one, but not to the other secured financial creditors, according to my understanding, this is also this is also a preferential transaction. Then we come to the negative section. Now the negative section is subsection three of section forty-three. Now for this purpose, the preference shall not include the following transfers. In case the transfer made in the ordinary course of business or financial affair of the corporate debtor. Now, when we say ordinary course of business or financial affair, so the ordinary course is common for both ordinary course of business or ordinary course of financial affairs of the corporate debtor or the transferring. So ordinary course is common, ordinary course of business or financial affairs. This is the one negative in case, in case it is not an ordinary course of business or if it is not an ordinary course of financial affairs then only this particular transaction can be classified as a preferential transaction under section 43 then comes is the any transfer creating a security interest in the property acquired by the corporate debtor to the extent now there may be a situation that although the company is under stress but then the company actually is creating a security interest taking a fresh loan, I mean, that is a separate transaction. That's actually is creating a new value for the corporate debtor. That is also excluded. You're creating a security interest on the assets. You have added some value in your assets. So the such security interest secures new value and was given at a time or after signing of the security agreement that contains a description of such property. So the very first agreement for taking a loan, creating a value of security interest, and then that new value must be mentioned in that. And that is what is the acquired, any, any property acquired out of the new loan taken where the security interest is created, that is also exempted from section 43. And second condition is that such transactions of taking loan should be registered with the information utility within 30 days of such transaction. So this is also very important. And see, like once you see this, there is one very, very small provisor line provided that any transfer made in pursuance of an order of a court shall not shall not preclude such transfer to be deeming to be deemed as a giving of preference to a corporate debtor no if i get an order from a court i have to make payment it is uh, applicable only on voluntary transactions if i get a court order i will have to pay so that will not be considered as a transaction made under section 43. So Ankit, this is a basically structure of the entire section. And now we will actually move on to our uh, PPT. So I will uh, uh, now move on to PPT. And uh, this is, although the PPT is very long, but then we would like to finish it in one hour. And we will skip some of the part of the research which has been done by our legal team. Again, thanks to the legal team, they've done a wonderful job. So this section we have already explained. Now, the who can file application is only liquidator or resolution professional. Section 43 is only applicable to these two parties. No third party, no creditor can file an application under section 43. Whereas in case of, in the case of section 45, in the case of undervalued transactions, in case, RP does not file the application before NCLT, then any creditor can file that application to NCLT for reporting any undervalued transaction. So this is also very important uh, understanding that we have recently got that the undervalued transactions can also be reported to NCLT by a creditor. So this is again the same uh, flow that I mentioned, opinion, forming an opinion and then appointing an auditor, then the uh, the uh, confirmed confirming and filing an application to the adjudicating authority, 
and this is the flow of the uh, transactions. Now, transfer of property interest theorem that we've already discussed, explanation also we have discussed. So this is what we said, that this is the flow like properties, interest their own, creditor, surety or guarantor. So this is the ordinary course of business, security, new value, all this actually we have discussed. And now we, since we now understand the flow of the uh, flow of this section uh, 43, now we can move on to the judgment of Anuj Jain. IRP for JP Infratech Limited versus Axis Bank Limited. This was a Supreme Court judgment. So in this case, the uh, let us understand first of all, there are two companies. One, we can say Jayaprakash Associate Limited, which is a holding company, which is an old company of J JP Group. And then uh, when they got the, when they signed the concession agreement for development of Greater Noida uh, Agra Highway, and then they, in fact, incorporated a special purpose vehicle, which is the uh, JIL. Uh, so uh, JIL means uh, the JP Infratech Limited. So this entire story of um, uh, JAL and JIL, not Jack and JIL, this the entire story of uh, JAL and JIL, this is actually, uh, it actually, it remained in the newspapers for longer. And maybe that many of us knows it, what is the story of JAL and JIL. So JIL is a special purpose vehicle for the purpose of implementation of this Greater Noida uh, uh, Expressway. And along the Greater Noida Expressway, a lot of land was given to them for the purpose of development of residential colonies, cities, sports complexes. And this, so that was done by how the, the land which was given, the land which was acquired and which was given to JIL, the special purpose vehicle, uh, it was owned by Jill, and what was done by the JP Group that the huge piece of land, which was owned by Jill, that was given to the creditors of Jal. The land which was owned by Jill was given as a security to the creditors of Jal, and that is the transaction, like creating security interest on the assets of JP Infratech, which is Jill, whereas the security interest is created in favor of the creditors of JAL, that is what was considered as preferential transaction. Jill, Jill owned a land, huge land, maybe about 3000 crore worth of land. The land was given to the creditors of JAL, and this was considered as a kind of uh, preferential transactions. So the first stage is the NCLT, NCLT and NCLT, in fact, uh, considered that the there, there is a, the concept of uh, uh, giving a property to a creditor's security, uh, that concept was missing. So the property was given to the creditors of JAL and the creditors of JAL, they were not the creditors of JIL. Even the JAL was also not a, a creditor of JIL as, as per the argument. So therefore, it was considered that this particular transaction doesn't fall into the section 43 preferential transactions. Not going into uh, huge details, but yes, the order was, uh, then, then we can see the NCLAT. When it went to NCLAT, NCLAT said that the uh, NCLAT, in fact, uh, the, uh, the NCLAT on uh, the of the opinion that the, uh, was of the opinion that the corporate debtor had created interest over its property, number one. However, no such interest had been created in favor of any creditor or a surety or a grantor or for on account of an antecedent financial debt or operational debt or other liabilities owned by the corporate debtor. And hence, section 43, subsection 2 is not attracted. And it, it was further observed that the mortgages in question were made in the ordinary course of business and financial affairs of the transferee, ruling out the applicability of section 43. As such, and hence, the adjudicating authority had no power to pass the order under section 44 of the code. So what is section 44? 
if there is a transaction which passes the test of two positive sections and also the test of one negative section which is subsection 3 two positive sections subsection 2 and 4 and section 4 uh, section 3 is a negative section if a transaction passes all the tests then the adjudicating authority will pass an order under section 44 so this section 44 we will just discuss that section 44 after some time but that is where the orders are passed under section 44 so therefore the nclat said that this uh, nclt had no powers to pass an order under section 44 because the benefit the property was transferred to the security was created in the favor of the financial creditors of jal the financial creditors were not the creditors of jill so therefore the first test that the benefit is given to the creditors for against antecedent debt so there was no antecedent debt the benefit had not gone to the creditors of the corporate debtor and then he then also the NCLAT said that this mortgage is an all was it was an ordinary course of business and financial affairs of the transferee. So therefore, this particular order passed by NCLT was incorrect. So this is where finally this matter went to the Supreme Court. Now, the, when the matter went to Supreme Court, then uh, I will not go into very, very technical details because this was a very large judgment and some of the uh, international concepts and some of the the bankruptcy reform committee uh, opinion was also given in this particular case so i would finally say that the uh, the ordinary course of business uh, was uh, it was being uh, contended by the appellants and the relevant period and the related party concept was also being contended uh, the the avoidance transaction and it was good faith was also uh, being contended under the companies act section 2329 of the companies act so uh, the the frauding uh, creditors the, the some of the uk law was also uh, uh, the so when we see the uh, respondents they were also uh, saying the irrelevant time the uh, the uncitral legislation so again finally uh, the analysis uh, of the uh, or analysis of the the arguments were based on the said transfer is for the benefit of creditor surety grantor the transfer is pursuant to an antecedent financial debt the security was provided in the ordinary course of income so the decision of the supreme court in this case the supreme of this uh, the uh, supreme uh, the, the condition it was explained like this ankit ankit before i move on i think now i have to just say what was the decision of supreme court and under what concept before i go if you could add something also from the question and answer sessions or you can just say because see, after the supreme court then we will uh, only attend to the latest judgment of 24th of april uh, that we will discuss and then it will be the today's webinar would be concluded yes ankit so Sanjay Goelji is asking that can we file an application under Section 45 against the resolution applicant? I don't think so. I think it's not the intention. Uh, no, I think can... the resolution applicant has not been excluded separately. Section 45 oh. deals with the Section 45 deals with the uh, undervalued transactions. If an undervalued transaction has already been taken place during the relevant period. It is irrelevant that that person has actually become later on a, 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 a resolution applicant or not. So the transactions that we have to handle. Transaction are, is important that whoever the transaction happened with, it can be any person, right? It can be any person. Like it can be later on, he can become resolution applicant. I mean, that's not okay. really. So, so the transaction at the time of. That's it. So that's okay. Yeah, that's understood. Yeah. So then, of course, the second question that we have is, can you please elaborate on the new value security interest once again with an example? So I think there we can say that, say, uh, a company has uh, yeah. approached um, uh, a bank and says that I have this security. You can create a charge on this security and give me additional facility. This is something that a company does with a creditor. So in that process, what the section says is that because you have given security to that creditor, but you have in return of that security received a loan or received funds with respect to that security. So therefore, 
uh, up till that amount that you have uh, given a security and which where you have uh, received any funds with respect to that that loan facility from that uh, from that lender till that amount this cannot be considered as a preferential transaction am i interpreting it correctly is there any addition yeah, that you would like right. to make uh, ankit uh, if a transaction has taken place a, a security interest has been created on the assets of the corporate debtor against that creation of security interest a new value has been given to the company a new loan has been given to the company and that transaction is a separate transaction which is also registered in insolvency uh, like uh, the um, iu uh, in the transaction has been recorded in iu so that would not be considered as a preferential transaction because for the first time that property was uh, uh, the security interest was created a new value was uh, created some new asset was purchased or uh, uh, the new uh, the the whatever loan was taken that was again used for the corporate debtor so that may be a second transaction how the loan was used but yes a security interest was created against a loan that is something which is uh, not covered but i definitely would say that you can't say that we have actually uh, mortgaged a property worth 100 crore and uh, have taken a loan of uh, 1 crore whereas the security interest has been created for against the existing loans also now if a debtor if a creditor has given you a loan of 50 crores and very close to the insolvency you take one more crore and give another property of 100 crore to that same creditor this is something which is a preferential transaction but if you have mortgaged 50 crores of property and taken only one crore of loan and there is no other charge on that particular property this is a new value and this is a new transaction and it is not considered to be a preferential transaction so in case uh, there is a mortgage a security mortgage is rupees 1000 uh, uh, 1000 and the loan taken is 100 so you're saying there is no preferential transaction i would or say that is this is a this is a separate transaction security is 100 loan taken is 10 1000 opposite security 1000 loan is 100 so 900 is preferential transaction right yes so when this person will file their claim he will only get uh, uh, 100 yeah the property is worth 1000 and the balance will come back to the other creditors so uh, then uh, can application be moved in case of value of assets of cd to be transferred to ra is very high as compared to value that was there at the time of submission of resolution plan in 2018 i think it's it's a post uh, uh, case so this like, transaction you know, that you are referring to this is a transaction which has taken place post commencement of cirp any transaction which is incurred or which has taken place post commencement of cirp is not and cannot be covered under section 43 or section 45 right so so like there is an anonymous attendee who is saying that in this case where 1000 crores of security has been given to somebody who is having a 100 crore loan that new creditor can receive only his due the balance portion will be available for others is yes, that that's what i exactly said because there is so no preference to the existing creditor against their existing debt it's a new debt it's a new debt and you have created a security uh, so there you're saying that yeah so there is no preferential transaction here so 900 no crores is not given to the existing creditor existing surety existing grantor against their existing liabilities maybe financial debt maybe operational debt maybe any other kind of liability mm -hmm. so it is a new but if an old loan is going on and a security is created against that old loan then that's a problem that's a problem. The, the loan is old and the security is fresh. That's what was done by JAL. Mm -hmm. In the case of, that was that was done to the creditors of JAL mm -hmm. by JIL. That mm -hmm. is what was the finally the Supreme Court said. Like we'll just see what exactly the Supreme Court is saying. And the Supreme Court has said finally that it is a preferential transaction. In the case of JAL and JIL. Okay. Okay, so should we uh, now go through what exactly the um, held portion of the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of uh, Jill? Yes.
The basic concept of preference as per the law, dictionaries and lexicons is the act of paying or securing to one or more of his creditors by an insolvent debtor the whole or part of their claims to the exclusion of the rest of the creditors. So the rest of the creditors were not paid, so one person is paid. Relevant time for the purpose of avoidance of preferential transaction is now commonly known as look back period. Look back period of one year, look back period of two years. Now, significantly when the preferential transaction is with the, the unconnected party, the look back period is comparatively lesser than that of the transaction connected party, like one year and two years, like insider or the related party. Now, the provisions contained in section 43 of the code indicate intention of the legislature that when a transaction falls within the coordinates defined therein, the same shall be deemed to be a preference given at a relevant time and shall not be countenanced. Therefore, the intent may not be of a defense or support of any preferential transaction that falls within the ambit of section 43. There is no intent of the legislature. Finally, uh, the, there are uh, separate provisions for section 66, and that's of course we know that. And uh, uh, the, then we uh, see the uh, preferential transaction, the, uh, we again section, again section, everything was again mentioned, subsection two, subsection four, and then subsection three, three is a negative section. That's again uh, mentioned by everything. Uh, the questions that the Supreme Court has said has to be, these are the questions that has to be examined. Transfer is for the benefit of a creditor. So this particular surety, transfer is for on account of antecedent financial debt. These are again Supreme Court, I've already said that, but basically my opinion uh, is definitely the same as the, I have drawn my opinion from the judgment and also from the, uh, the uh, act. Transfer has the effect of putting such creditor or a surety or a grantor in a beneficial position than it would have been in the event of distribution under Section 53. Transfer had been for the benefit of a related party, that's like other than employee. Transfer was not an excluded transaction under Section 63, which is a negative section. So the, the deciding factor in this particular case in Jal and Jill, because see, Jal was a holding company, and is a creditor also surety of CD. It was a related party to CD. So that was almost confirmed that it was a related party. And the CD owned owed antecedent financial debts as also operational debt and other liabilities towards gel. So the Supreme Court here for the first time said that this CD means Jill was otherwise having some debts towards the holding company, which is JAL, maybe financial debt, maybe operational debt, maybe some other liabilities. So for the first time, the Supreme Court said that definitely Chal was an existing creditor to Jill. This is for the first time. It was not uh, taken up by NCLT or NCLAT. And the, it actually put the Jal in a beneficial position. So once the Jal is a creditor, it, it was putting the Jal in a beneficial position position, the Jill has definitely given a preference to JAL. And also it the transaction came into the look back period. And once it came into the look back period, the section 43 is applicable and the order under section 44 uh, can be passed. And the affairs of the corporate debtor, it, it was not a transaction, it was a normal, ordinary course of business. It was not. So the, the also the concept of twilight zone was discussed. The twilight zone, in fact, what we say section 43, section option four, which is a look back period. Now the look back period also is called as twilight zone. Now the twilight zone is a period which is defined in the dictionary in such a manner that once the sun is set, it is not visible. However, there is still some light. Sun is set. It is not visible. However, still there is some light. And after that, and everyone knows that now this light also will go. Now this light also will go because the sun has already gone. It will only stay for about 15, 20 minutes or what maximum half an hour. So that is what is twilight soon. When 
the transaction takes place. That means now the sun is already set, means the business of the company is already gone. There is no viability. The company has to now go into dark. Any transaction done in this twilight zone is considered to be a transaction done in a relevant period, in a look back period. So in some cases, when the twilight zone is not established, when it is established by any person that even the transaction, even if the transaction has taken place in the first two years, but it was not a twilight zone. The company was absolutely healthy. It was only the company actually became insolvent only because of the last six months. Events happened in the last six months actually was decisive in a manner that this company is now dead. Maybe natural calamity, maybe other things. In that particular case, the twilight zone actually will shrink further because the twilight zone is important as per various international judgments. So this is only a concept so far. It has not been handled by any of Indian court, but it's only a concept that in some cases, this particular look back period can be reduced in those cases where the promoters were 100% having no idea that the company is going towards a bad period. In that particular time, somebody can say the twilight zone in this case only started when this fire took place or when the natural calamity happened or when the change of the law happened. That was happened in the last six months, whereas the transaction took place much before the six month period. However, it was within the look back period of two years. In those cases, the twilight zone can be even reduced. This is what I uh, want to say. Uh, so then ordinary course of business was also like discussed at length. So the one any transfer which is when which can be considered as an ordinary course of business and which is happening almost everyday business. If a company is doing a business, it's a running company, the creditors are giving material and they are getting their payment. The creditors are giving material and they are getting their payment. And within two years or within one year, the company goes into insolvency. Now, whatever payment has been given to all these operational creditors, these are all given in the ordinary course of business or ordinary course of financial affairs. No, ordinary course of financial affairs are that I have taken a car loan and I'm paying installments. And those installments are coming as the three years installments and I'm paying it. So that's an ordinary course of business. And these are the transactions that are actually happening in the ordinary course of business, ordinary course of business or financial affairs. Business means I'm buying, I'm paying. Ordinary course of financial affairs is that I have taken a loan and there, is a, there are installments going on and I'm continuously paying my installments. However, in case I'm not paying to a operational creditor for the last two years, and suddenly when this, uh, I started paying immediately on a particular uh, uh, event uh, uh, during this look back period, and I started paying to my old debtor and I'm not paying to my regular current debtor. If I'm also paying to the current debtors, current creditors, and also paying to the old creditors uh, as, as a strategy of the business, that also is an ordinary course of business. If I have entered into a contract with the bankers that I will pay you these installments, that's an ordinary course of financial affairs of the company. So this is like very important to understand what is ordinary course of business or what is ordinary course of financial affairs of the company or the transferring. So where I am seeing it is or even the word or is also discussed and it actually was considered and. So that means that when we are considering ordinary course of business, it should also be having and financial affairs. So if a particular business and financial affairs, both should look ordinary course both should look ordinary course. So that is what has been decided by the Honorable Supreme Court that this transaction was not in the ordinary course of business or ordinary course of financial affairs or and both in fact has to be used as and. So where I am trying to say here in this case is the once the uh, what is ordinary course and what is uh, the ordinary course of financial affairs. So this can actually be handled by various uh, uh, various uh, various kinds of illustrations. 
here i would like to see what kind of questions the audience is asking what are the ordinary course of business and what are the ordinary course of financial affairs so this is ankit uh, where i would like to say uh, transfer made in the ordinary course of business or financial affairs uh, this this is something which is very very uh, important because see the even the this particular judgment some australian judgments were also discussed so the uh, the illustrations like in case we see but then this is these are the duties of the R rp that i will come later so let us first of all see if there is any question on ordinary course of business or ordinary course of financial affairs of the cd or the transferee so uh uh anil sharma ji is asking that if a related party financial creditors creditor enjoy section 53 priority over operational creditor otherwise all positive conditions are met would section 43 apply so he's saying so in case section, uh, yeah. in case uh, ankit that's very clear that in case a related party is a creditor unsecured or secured and there is no other unsecured creditor or there is no other uh, secured financial creditor so in case company goes into insolvency immediately he will have the first right of payment so no adverse impact has actually taken place on the rights of operational creditors so therefore in particular situation in case the money is being paid to a related party and the related party is a unsecured financial creditors and there are no other financial unsecured financial creditors or there are no other secured financial creditors then this person has the first priority after the cirp cost or after the liquidation cost therefore this is not a section 43 transaction okay so ravi ji is asking when can section 43 transaction be treated as section 66 transaction a preferential transaction to be treated as one to be one to defraud the creditors so as to get the benefit of longer timelines so i i can try and answer this so section 66 we say uh, with respect to uh, fraudulent trading so there when we take a transaction which is otherwise maybe a you know section 43 transaction or a preferential transaction or preferential payment in section 66 when we take it it is normally one because you have used the money or you know paid the money maybe to related party entities in violation of uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, sanction letter alternatively you say that you have done and you have done that before the two year period so that's when you kind of say that that was a fraudulent activity that was done that the company prepaid the related party loans as compared to the uh, the financial creditors so that's what we normally cover as 66 where you know otherwise if had that transaction been within 2 years it might have been part of 43 as well yes i think the uh in case the corporate debtor tries to keep some kind of property of the company away from the creditors mm. and tries to take it away then that is also kind of considered as fraudulent however section 49 is also very important to be seen because section 49 is also a kind of extension to section 45 when undervalued transactions are happening with the intent to defraud the creditors then it actually goes to section 49 and then in that section 49 there is no look back period similarly in section 66 also there is no look back period similarly in section 49 also there is no look back period because section 49 is basically applicable when there is a undervalued transaction and that too with a fraudulent intent and where the intent is to defraud the creditors that is section 49 and there is no look back period for section 49 so i would advise that in case you find any transaction which is a undervalued transaction and you feel that it is going beyond the look back period then also you can look into fraudulent intent and in case you find fraudulent intent is these transactions then you can actually make an application under section 49 rather than section 45 so that will be for undervalued but not maybe for preferential preferential not for will be different yeah yes so then anil anchalia ji is asking goods were not received in look back period but payments have been made by previous year dues 
whether those payments are considered to be preferential payments yes yes they should be now the uh, ordinary course of business can be considered that presently i have paid all my existing creditors operational creditors there is no overdue still i have some money so i would like to pay to the old operational creditors like if it is like if in case uh, it is seen i think it can still be considered as an ordinary course of business i am no, not here, think, yes but here the idea and what he is sharing is that the there were no goods that were received from that party in the look back period but only payments were being made in preference over the financial creditors so it's the company was not paying to the banks but was paying to operational creditors any payment to old operational creditors mm -hmm. without an order from the court that can also be considered as preferential payment yeah that's what he is asking so it would not be uh, uh, it would be a preferential uh, transaction then so then uh, uh, mr bhattachar is asking if promoters uh, promoter has transferred car owned by cd in his own name at very low value will 43 be attracted it is a case of under value transaction not 43 yeah 43 will be preferential this will be a case of um, so that is how it is then um, uh, mr goel uh, mr sunny goel is asking major payments made in 2012 that is 80% of the payments allotment made in april 2015 agreement to sell and 20% payment made on 2017 proceeding started in 2018 will it be covered in look back period for the under valuation purpose of section 45 no under valuation as far as real estate cases are concerned under valuation is only uh, within the look back period mm -hmm. and uh, the in case you try to fix this particular scenario where in 5 years before the transaction took place almost at 50% of the price so that actually would not be considered as with the intent of fraud the fraud of defrauding the creditor so section 49 also would not be applicable because in real estate cases if 5 years before a person has been allotted a particular property at 2500 rupees per square foot and after 2 years other people were getting it for 5000 or 7000 so the person who has got it at 2500 would not be considered as undervalued because this was beyond the look back period and it was with no uh, fraudulent intent temporary funds given to holding or subsidiary company before crp date and returned before crp date so in case this there is, is no amount due exactly today this puja bari's case is mm -hmm. this is what exactly pura puja bari's case is taking funds is is a is a uh, definitely ordinary course of business but repayment has to be done within the look back period as per the priorities under section 53 So, so in case, no here the i think the question is given the different it is the funds were given by the company or the cd under crp before crp date and then it got it back before the crp date so it is not a case of making a payment so it they made a payment then they got it back so it was a loan and they got it back that's what i'm saying in case the company receives a loan from related parties and then it is being paid within the look back period it's the opposite i think here it is, the, it is no I... here the money is being paid by the cd to its holding or subsidiary companies and it is coming back later no once it is paid and it is coming back only yeah, the it's a, it's a loans and advances it's a loans and advances that you can say is only for the interest part of it that can be considered as under value transaction nothing else so then date of allotment is important or agreement to sell in case of look back period for the purpose of transfer um uh, date, date of, of uh, date of allotment is important date of allotment when a person moves an application finally when crp admitted by by uh, ao uh, aa the transaction goes out of purview of preferential transaction due to passing of substantive substantial time doesn't did not defeat the purpose of the law so i think the idea is that he's asking that because it is taking some time for double a to take an action and pass the crp order then the date of crp initiation is already maybe one year after the first application is filed with the nclt 
that's what i think this is about i so, think this was also discussed uh, in a, in, a, in the colloquium and there was a suggestion that the look back period should start from the date of filing of the application i'm not sure whether the government will agree for this particular suggestion or not i think this observation is very correct and uh, that is one reason that most of the companies most of the promoters they try to delay their orders and they try to uh, engage uh, uh, the the big legal team to delay so that's something which is the is, it is in the knowledge of the government and the government also proposed that the look back period will start from the date of filing of the application so let's see whether this amendment takes place or not but then just a nice nice observation good whether a secured creditor acquiring loan from another secured creditor who also has pari parsu charge thereby improving its charge from pari parsu to exclusive will be considered as a preferential transaction this is an ordinary course of business uh, ordinary, ordinary course of financial affairs of the cd or the transferees i don't think there is anything here in the twilight period can the squeeze depending can can the twilight period can be squeezed depending upon the circumstances when one of one when, when then when then on the same reasoning the twilight period can be enhanced in a case petition for crp filed in early 2021 with crp started in late 2022 so twilight period can be enhanced um, uh, like uh, no i don't think the law provides for any enhancement of the twilight period here the law is very specific no, the, with respect to one or two years we haven't seen any order where this look back period has been enhanced in the fact court, we did yeah, some good. applications initially and we saw that the court is not inclined to go beyond the look back period as far as section 43 45 and 50 is concerned so the mm. court is not inclined to go beyond look back period so i think then there are very very specific questions which can be skipped um so unless and until there is another question that maybe somebody has left he can post they can post again but i think i've taken up most so here they see in this duties and responsibilities of the rp as i said that there is a checklist of positive points and negative points and then that's what is is again illustrated here the how the rp is supposed to first of all filter all the transactions then also divide into the one year and two years and then also divide into the related parties and unrelated parties and then uh, uh, the this look uh, for the checklist in case all the checkpoints are uh, ticked then these transactions can be considered as uh, the uh, transactions so this is a case which is dina rasayan udyog private limited versus pooja bari dated 24th of april so these are the contentions of the appellant and the finally the appellant and the contentions of the and the the, the honorable uh, anclad in this case says uh, the, the the transactions however the allegation then or see the and rejected the submission of the appellant that since the composite application was filed so in this case the rp filed a composite application composite application under section 45 and as well as 43 so the it was not accepted the appellant the the uh, aggrieved promoters or the uh, aggrieved person against the order of nclt he went to to nclt and also says that the rp filed a composite application although although the supreme court has already guided that the rp or the liquidator should file separate applications under section 43 45 50 49 and 66 the court has also said that for a faster result any high value transactions should be filed separately i mean this is what is my opinion i'm sorry the court has never said the court has only said but well, see the Uh, arguments and the order the kind of uh, in all the uh, three or four or five sections are can be different and also making multiple parties as respondents is also not liked by the court in case there are 20 transactions and we make all 20 people as respondent in one transaction i would say that the higher value transactions should be put separately and the lower value transactions should be put separately that's where we actually feel comfortable the courts feel comfortable and you can even get faster orders otherwise for about 12 15 respondents the even the, the proceedings are not completed so it may take about a uh, number of uh, uh, years uh, regarding this so that's something which is um, uh, very important so in, in this case the even anclad rejected that the, the it was a composite application 
so uh, uh, the uh, has rightly allowed the application was also the questions of intent and motive is not relevant the intent and motive is not relevant while examining as to whether a transaction is a preferential transaction because that was also mentioned in anuj jain because the intent and motive is not really uh, important uh, the so therefore the uh, in this particular case it was also argued that some security checks were given to the creditors so the creditors started threatening that they will file cases under section 138 and they started issuing demand notices therefore the payment was made to them so in this particular case it's very very important judgment that the the proviso only says the proviso to section 43 subsection 3 only says that if a payment is made pursuant to a court order that will not be considered as preferential transaction however the apprehensions of a litigation threat of litigation security checks that would not be considered as the directions of the court so any payment made to operational creditors or related parties or unrelated parties which is giving preference to them despite they had security checks despite they had the demands so that is also considered as preferential transactions and the preferential transaction is a transaction which is voluntary transaction where the copy debtor was to enter into a transaction due to pressure and threat and the same is clearly not a private transaction this was the this was the argument however it was rejected it was rejected by the tribunal ordinary course of business was also discussed at length and the the business and good faith was also discussed at length so i think ankit we have to just conclude it because we've done most of this part so uh, what is the what is the final conclusion on this part puja bhari matter what what happened the final so they said it is ordinary course they said the payments are in ordinary course of business right no they have said that payments made to those parties even if they were threatening for 138 that would actually be considered as preferential transactions it, it, it was it is not a court okay. order it is not a court order it so is it only was, threat so understood so uh, any other like i think we can wind up because we it's actually 1205 yeah and yeah. in case there are no other observations and we can close so great uh, thank you everyone thank you everyone for being part of this uh, process and uh, a good recap on uh, section 43 that we had today so also maybe other avoidance transactions as well Thank you. Thank you, all the uh, participants for uh, staying with us and uh, look forward to meet you in the uh, 57th episode of our AAA uh, weekly uh, webinar series next Saturday at 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you.